male voice and he said, I wish you were my Valentine. And I looked back and it was just a guy in a car. I didn't really like think too much of it. And he's like, do you need a ride? He was warm, there wasn't warning flags. In my mind at 18, I thought I don't wanna walk in the cold and this guy's offered me a ride. That was a life decision that I made and I didn't even know it. He was just a nice guy. I felt safe with him, you know, and I knew that nobody was gonna hurt me. There was no red flags about him and this is the best predator. They'll prey on their victims before they pounce. So I meet this guy that gives me all of this help and then he's like, I see something in you. He's like, I see potential to be something great. And in that moment, he gave me more confidence in myself than I've ever had ever. And I remember that conversation being so intense where he's like, there's a lot of things you have to do to get on top. I can show you the way, but you have to trust me. He pulled up to a trailer park, which had been already familiar to me because we had been there before and he asked me if I wanted to come in with him. So I went in and he pulled me aside. He's like, I need you to do me a solid. He's like, I owe this guy a favor. Just make him happy. I didn't see myself as anything that was valuable. So it was just like, I guess, like take one for the team. And I did it. And I got in the car and was in tears. He gave me a big high five. And he's like, you're an effing rock star. He was so proud of me, and I did something right. I made him happy. Because I thought he was a good person, I wanted that acceptance from him. All right. And he took out $300 in cash, and he threw it at me. That's our future. We're going to go to the top, and we're going to do it together. And he made it sound like this big like power couple, this Bonnie and Clyde. He sold me a dream. He sold me my salvation. What I needed in my life was happiness. And I believed it. I believed everything he said. After the first couple weeks of little house calls and stuff, I got into his car one day and he's like, we're gonna step it up. We're gonna take this to the next level. You're ready. We're gonna stay in a hotel tonight. I bought you some stuff. So he had picked out some lingerie. And then he's like, all right, so we need to take some pictures of you. I'm like, are you gonna send them? Like, I didn't know what he was doing. But he's like, do you trust me or not? He started talking to me about Backpage. He's like, this is where the big money's at. And he posted the ad on Backpage and he gave me a phone. He's like, when you have this phone, I take your phone. So then he sat me down that night and he's like, we're gonna talk about the game. And if you learn how to play it, you can win. And I did feel in control. I felt like we've got this. And that's where he took grooming to training. On that night, he's like, all right, someone's gonna come in here, do your thing. Guy comes in, it's the owner of the hotel. Instantly I knew that was a trade. I was being programmed as a human mule. He would give me substances to help me stay awake. And then I kind of stopped doing human things. I remember days I wouldn't even eat. I was in that room 24 seven. He put me in scenarios where I don't feel like some women would have wanted to live after. I was not even a person anymore. I was like, this isn't my life, this isn't me. Parents need to really delve into their children. And we as parents, we should know our children anyway. So we should be able to say, you know, she didn't eat her favorite dish tonight, why? I had someone ask me, why are you always green? Because he would mark up anything but my face. That's a common sign. There had been an investigation going in the Poconos to round up all the traffickers. And when a bunch of other girls were being questioned, they were being questioned about this man. And one of the girls said, there's one girl that can put this all together for you and they put that mugshot in front of me and I sat there for hours and I told them everything. 
the 2019, sentenced to 33 years in prison for sex and drug trafficking. The day of the trial, I got to see him, and it was the most empowering thing to know that he couldn't hurt me anymore, and he couldn't hurt anyone else. And I think that's where I found my power. I think it kind of has helped heal a part of me, and it's me taking the story and making it my own. It wasn't something I chose, but it's something I went through. You can use that experience negatively, or you can use it positively. And it did something good. It helped put some people away that are not going to hurt anybody. If there's more success stories and there's a light at the end of the tunnel for some of these women, they'll take it. I know at the end of the day that I'm going to take this story and I'm going to help as many people as I can. I see something in the long run much bigger than me. I know that there's nothing that I can't overcome. And I have never been happier. Good morning and welcome to the training. This training is a collaborative effort between the Office of Victim Advocate, Mission Kids Child Advocacy Center, Montgomery County, Villanova Law Institute to address commercial sexual exploitation, the Sexual Offender Assessment Board, film producer Shuji Moore, and survivor leaders Tammy McDonald and Anastasia Joy. My name is Suzanne Estrella and I'm the Commonwealth Victim Advocate. This is a grant funded project and made available from a grant we received from the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. The Office of Victim Advocate advocates for the rights of and needs of all crime survivors. We chose this project because commercial exploitation continues to plague communities throughout the Commonwealth, while awareness of the issue, what happens and how it happens is not commonly understood. We are hopeful that this awareness project will serve as a first step in combating this horrific crime. Uh, please type in the chat and let us know where you're listening from. Uh, through the project funding, we worked together and in early June, we launched a statewide sexual exploitation awareness campaign with billboards, social media advertisements, cards, posters, radio advertisements, the team um, worked really hard to create a landing page where materials are available electronically. And by contacting our office, you can receive printed copies as well as a thumb drive with all the materials from today's training. The training today is designed to assist service providers who engage survivors of commercial sexual exploitation. Not just victim advocates, we're hoping to reach parents, teachers, healthcare providers, any service provider that has access to young people. Service providers will be taught how to utilize the materials created by this project and best practices for engaging survivors whose trauma stems from sexual abuse. This training will also include an overview of the Sexual Offender Registration and Notification Act and victims' rights regarding notification and access to community-based assistance. I wanna to start today by uh, acknowledging and introducing our survivor leaders. Our program began this morning with an incredible story of resiliency and, and survival shared by Anastasia Joy. Anastasia has participated in this awareness project because she believes in the power of storytelling. We admire her bravery and value the truth that she brings to the table. Tammy McDonald, another of our survivor leaders in the fight to end commercial sexual exploitation, has bravely shared her story as a part of this project in hopes that with this awareness comes the education needed to end the demand of sex buying and help those who have been affected by this egregious act of violence. Her video story will be completed in July and available for resource sharing. I'm gonna ask you to help me virtually welcome Anastasia and Tammy. I know Tammy's having some internet issues, so I hope that she's going to be able 
um, to hop on with us. And if not, hopefully then we can speak to her at the end of the program when we talk about, um, when we do the panel discussion. But let's see, is Anastasia on and ready to join us? I can ask my tech person to um, allow her to be unmuted and let's see if she would like to address us. Hey there. She is. I'm here. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, I just wanted to ask and um, let, give you an opportunity to share with the audience. What do you hope that others will learn from your story? I would just say um, awareness is the biggest deal with uh, sex trafficking these days. A lot of people don't know it's happening in, in our backyards. And um, I would hope that stories like mine would be more talked about and more women come out um, so that we can just be more aware of it. Um, especially, like I said, in the video with our children, um, a lot of, I mean, I didn't even know what sex trafficking was even while I was being trafficked because it wasn't, it talked about story. It wasn't, you know, a, a fear of mine. So I think talking to our youth and our children about sex trafficking and the signs of it so that if any women or men or anyone is put in those positions that they can see the signs and be like oh wait this could be this could be a sign of trafficking um so yeah i would just hope that my video can speak to parents out there and young and our youth just to get um like i said just more more awareness out there All right now i know that through your your journey you had the opportunity to engage with many service providers and if you had to pick, let's say, maybe one or two things that you would tell us as advocates and service providers, what's the one thing that you think we should never do? Service providers as far as um, like- Whether it's an ad, yeah, law enforcement, uh, a victim advocate. I've worked with would... many. I would say police enforcement is probably the most intimidating, especially for victims. Um, I was in several scenarios where police enforcement were very harsh with me and I recoiled and didn't talk or didn't tell them the truth. Um, I had been in, I've been in several domestic abusive relationships as well, where I was afraid of the police or telling them the truth. Um, so I feel like our police enforcement should never come at a victim as a, as a criminal and they need to all, even if they are, um, you always need to handle these situations gently so that women will be will be more, you know, brave enough to talk to you. I feel like um, having um, someone there with you, uh, police enforcement should have, you know, advocates with them. Women are not going to feel safe um, talking if they don't feel safe. Sorry, <laughs> women aren't going to feel. I'm sorry. No, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's... they're not going to feel brave enough to speak if they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel you should never come at a victim as a criminal. I think that's important. Right. We certainly appreciate you um, sharing your expertise and your insight with us and being a part of this project. And thank you so much for, for sharing your story and being so brave. I don't know if Tammy has been able to log back in. Okay, well, we'll save some space and hopefully we'll be able to, to meet her later on in the day. So um, our first presenter for today is the executive director and co-founder of the Villanova Law Institute to address commercial sexual exploitation. Shay Rhodes is an expert in the field and has been working to elevate the voices of survivors for years. She is instrumental in training attorneys and legal professionals in providing trauma-informed legal services and successfully bringing cases to hold offenders accountable for commercial exploitation. Shay's work not only impacts the Commonwealth, but she works internationally to end commercial sexual exploitation. We are thrilled to have her as a part of the collaborative effort. Uh, welcome, Shay Rhodes. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint up here. And I 
Are we in business? Can everybody see it? Or are you seeing my presenter view? We see your presenter view, Shay. How about that? There you go. I'm getting good at this. So I just want to say thank you to Suzanne and Ashley and the whole team at OVA for including us in this collaboration. Um, one of the big pieces of our mission here at the Institute um, is truly cross-disciplinary collaboration. I think that the fight against human trafficking cannot be done in silos. And so often we see people not, you know, crossing over disciplines and leveraging the strengths of, of um, people who do something different from us. I think, you know, I, my team is in the business of solving legal problems and we're lawyers. And I know that um, the survivors who are our clients really benefit from the fact that we do work cross-disciplinary with victim advocates, with case managers, because building a community of support around survivors is so critical. So thank you for including me and my team in, in this process. It's been really wonderful. And I'm hoping that our Commonwealth um, will re really benefit from our work and in, including the, the public service announcements and everything that we've been working on. I only have a half an hour and um, there is just way too much information to <laughs> convey in a half an hour. Um, but I know all of you are going to be getting our slides and I think it's really important to have the law in front of you because built right into the law, both the federal law and our Commonwealth law on human trafficking are the red flags that I think are really critical for people to understand how they play out through the law. It's like the elements of the crime built into the law are what prosecutors ultimately have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt before a jury. And I think that if you unpack the law, the red flags, both for children and adults, are, are right there. So at the end of my presentation, I hope you understand the basics of the law. Again, you're going to get um, our slides, and I work in a green building, and my light just went off, of course, it never fails. Um, so if you have any questions, please reach out to me. That's what we're here for, the ongoing technical assistance interpretation of the law, because I'm going to fly through that really quickly. Um, I, so I also want to tell you all about Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Children, which we advocated for and ultimately passed in 2018, how it changed the law as it relates to children who are victims of sex trafficking. I think I'm preaching to the choir here. I see a lot of familiar names on understanding the, the basics of psychological trauma and recognizing how they can impact our clients or those that you are serving and integrate trauma-informed care into your professional functions. Again, this is a really ambitious slideshow. So let's get started right away here. So I don't know why it's not moving forward. Let's try this. So the federal sex trafficking law became, the, you know, it was the first law of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act passed in the year 2000. So for all intents and purposes, we've only had a law in the United States on, labor, you know, creating the crime of labor trafficking and the crime of sex trafficking for 22 years. So think about that in the context of when new laws get passed, it takes a really long time for people to understand what the law is. Implementation is really key. So My slideshow is just not cooperating. It's been reauthorized. It's up for reauthorization again. I think this will be the seventh time it's reauthorized, but the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, which passed in 2015, amended the United States crime, um, specifically related to sex trafficking, and it created a fund for domestic victims of trafficking. It mandated additional trainings. It, up, it called upon all states to amend their child protective services law. Pennsylvania did that and a sexually exploited child now is in that list of things that mandated reporters must report. So if you are a mandated reporter, look at your child protective services law, a sexually exploited child, a victim of sex trafficking is 
um, you know, someone who's experiencing child abuse. And if you are a mandated reporter, please make sure that your policies and protocols are updated on that. It also included three acts to criminal conduct in the federal crime, including advertises, patronizes, and solicits. So here's the law, right? I just want you all to have the slides so you can read the full federal law. It's called sex trafficking of children or by force, fraud and coercion. Looks like a lot of words on this page and it is a lot of words, but very simply, you need to have three things in order to prove the crime of human trafficking. You need to have an act, only one of those acts. It has to be done by the means of force, fraud or coercion for the purpose of a commercial sex act, because we're talking about sex trafficking. So the purpose is a commercial sex act really quickly. What is, a what is a commercial sex act? It's when anything of value is exchanged for a sex act. It doesn't have to be money. It can be clothing, shelter, safety, drugs, a whole myriad of things that have value. Now keep in mind that these means of force, fraud and coercion are not necessary to be proven in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt if the victim is a child. It's just not an element of the crime if the victim is a child, but that does not mean that force, fraud, and coercion are not being used against that child. You just don't have to prove it in a court of law. So these acts are recruiting, enticing, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, advertising, maintaining, patronizes, or solicits. Pennsylvania has all of those things in our crimes code with the exception of patronizes and we have a totally separate crime which is in chapter 30 our chapter on human trafficking called patronizing a victim of sexual servitude so you only need one of those acts or this knowingly financially benefiting or receiving anything of value it's for third party facilitators is what we call them people who are helping traffickers do one of those acts. And most simply, it would uh, be a hotel, right? And we know in the middle district, the corporate entity of a hotel was convicted in addition to some of the hotel employees. Harboring is the act, right? You stay in a hotel, but they were knowingly benefiting financially from helping the traffickers out, right? And they were making money doing it. So really quickly, what do these acts elements mean? Recruiting, how, it, how does recruiting happen? It's by targeting vulnerable children and adults. I highly recommend the short documentary, The Trap. Just Google The Guardians, The Trap, and um, Alexia, who's part of my team is on here. Alex can put the link to The Trap. It's 32 minutes. It just talks about one way that um, adults are recruited out of jails and prisons. It doesn't have to be in the pursuit of money. It could be using someone else um, who is part of, you know, also being trafficked to recruit others to be part of the trafficking. And of course, social media and technology are rampant um, with ways that individuals are recruited. Enticing, that means buying gifts, clothing, beauty products, treatments, making false promises or selling the dream, right? Promising someone something, I love you, I'm gonna take care of you. Creating pseudo family dynamics. Providing can be finding, you know, the sex purchasers, arranging the dates. It could also be giving someone, you know, their once a week McDonald's meal. Please cooperate. Here we go. Harbors. I already talked slightly a little bit about the hotel industry, but the hotel industry does have dual liability. And there are co-occurring crimes, other crimes that could be charged along with this, like kidnapping and false imprisonment. We're going to be publishing an update to our hotel policy paper on our website this week. Um, so, you know, keep a lookout for our website and Lex can put all that information again in the chat for you guys. Transports. We have federal case law on this, but we know that transport can be driving someone someplace. It could be also be buying the bus tickets, renting the car. Um, it's not just, you know, driving them physically. It could also be, you know, hiring the taxi. And again, we need to look at the transportation industry as potentially being complicit and could also be charged as third party facilitators. Maintains, that means limiting access to transportation or cutting off communication with the outside world. It could be providing access to controlled substance or limiting access to controlled substance. 
advertises, we talk about this all the time. The internet is the new street corner and technology is a huge way that people are bought and sold for sex and also recruited. It could be paying for ads, drafting the ads, taking photographs for the ads, uploading them from your phone, etc. Patronizes and solicits specifically apply to the demand that drives the market for trafficking to exist. So in this context, it would be those who buy sex. This came down through federal case law in 2013, where a federal court held that obtaining someone for commercial sex is broad enough to apply to both traffickers and sex buyers. Also the Palermo Protocol, which is an international treaty that we are a party to in the US, calls for the demand to be investigated and prosecuted as traffickers when appropriate, specifically those who are considered high frequency buyers and obviously those who buy children for sex. Every time someone who is buying a child for sex, they should be charged as a trafficker. So the means of force, fraud and coercion, again, it's not an element of the crime that has to be proven in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt if the victim is a child, but we know that traffickers do use force, fraud and coercion for adults and children. So we know that um, you know, force is pretty self-explanatory. It's beatings, cigarette burns, all types of you know, physical injuries. Fraud in the context of sex trafficking, we have federal case law that tells us that boyfriend type behavior does constitute a fraud that's part of selling the dream, right? It's a pattern of convincing someone that they love them, um, you know, just do this for me. So that's what fraud is in the context of sex trafficking and coercion. It's, you know, getting someone to do something against their will by, you know, making them promises. And that's where a lot of the, the psychological trauma really takes hold is through coercion. Again, I already talked about what a commercial sex act is. It's anything of value given to or received by any person, you know, for sex. So just keep in mind that those who are committing the acts, really um, the law applies to a broad spectrum of conduct and indiscriminately applies to traffickers, the demand, who, those who purchase sex, and those third party party facilitators like the hotels. And again, just because a victim might be seen by law enforcement as prostituting, which is a crime in our crimes code, doesn't mean that law enforcement and prosecutors need to exercise their discretion to prosecute that person. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And we really need to be focusing our energy if um, you know policing the sex trade is something that does happen throughout Pennsylvania, the focus really does need to be on the traffickers, those who make money helping traffickers do what they do and the demand that drives the market for it to exist in the first place. So Pennsylvania, here's our crime and our crimes code. It's um, the definitions start in chapter 30 in section 3001. It passed in 2014. So it's been on our books for eight years at this point. So again, in Pennsylvania, this is a relatively new crime in the, you know, in the context of how long our crimes code has been around, but it focuses on three primary goals, prosecution, prevention, which is why we're here, right? We wanna make sure that we prevent it from happening in the first place. And then of course, protecting our victims and survivors on the path to healing. Our definition of sexual servitude brings us in line with the federal government and the fact that it's any sex act or performance involving a sex act for which anything of value is directly or indirectly given, promised to, or received by any individual, or which is performed or provided by any individual. This is long. It's a commercial sex act. That's what it means, is of induced or obtained from a minor, or if the victim is an adult, any of those means set forth in section 3012B. So again, our law doesn't say force, fraud, and coercion. We have 13 factors that we can put in those categories of force, fraud, and coercion. Again, if the victim of a trafficker is a child, don't have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. It just doesn't mean that it's not happening to those children. So again, here is our definition. You guys are going to get all these slides, of course. But what I think, and, and trafficking in minors is, is you know, a piece of all of this. So that's 3011B. And then these means, these 13 factors, I think it's really important. And you can physically look at the crimes code and see what force, fraud, and coercion are and how our General Assembly really like listed it out. 
This is a really good way of seeing the, the red flags and what traffickers do built right into the law, right? Force, it's the first three in section 3012B, causing or threatening to cause harm, physically restraining, kidnapping or attempting to kidnap. Our law does say fraud, right? We have that federal case. We don't have any case law in Pennsylvania yet telling us what fraud is in the context of sex trafficking, but we can look to that Bell case, that federal case, which tells us it's that boyfriend type behavior. Coercion is abusing or threatening to abuse the legal process. This could be in the context of saying, oh, you have kids. I'm going to call DHS on you. Um, I'm going to get you evicted from your home. It could, you know, abusing or threatening to abuse the legal process taking or retaining an individual's personal or real property. You can leave the hotel room right now, but I own everything you're wearing. It's freezing cold outside. Are you gonna feel safe to leave completely not clothed and without shoes? Um, we've also seen it in the context where traffickers have forced parents of children to sign over the deeds to their home. I've seen that in Philadelphia. It's engaging in unlawful contact conduct with respect to documents. This does not just apply solely to documents of foreign nationals, like holding a passport or a visa. This also applies to any state identification document. If a trafficker is holding an ID, again, that's engaging in unlawful contact with respect to documents. Extortion, saying, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to you know, send this video to your mom, or I'm going to make it viral on one of those websites that, that displays pornography and doesn't verify the age of, or even the permission of the individual who was filmed. We have criminal coercion in here. It's defined in our crimes code in 2906. It's duress through the use or threat to use force against the victim or someone else the victim knows, like family member. It's debt coercion you know, paying for things and then tacking it on to money that's owed. I think it's really important, especially here in Pennsylvania, we know that um, people are using our opioid crisis against victims and, you know, giving them heroin, also withholding them, holding heroin and forcing them to be dope sick. And then finally using any scheme, plan or pattern intended to cause the victim to believe that if they don't continue to do commercial sex acts that they or someone else is gonna suffer physical harm. So I say fall back on the crimes code, you'll get your factors um, and red flags right there. In 2018, our General Assembly passed Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Children. And what it did was um, focus on four goals, to protect and not prosecute our child victims, empower state agencies to support our child victims, enhance law enforcement efforts to assist our victims of child sex trafficking and to establish a fund for victim services and awareness. So here again is where it's all listed, but it's really important for people to understand that a child in Pennsylvania, anybody under the age of 18, can no longer be charged with the crime of prostitution. It was deleted from the Juvenile Act. It also provides immunity for the crime of obstruction of the highway. There is a specific delineated diversion program. If a child could be charged with criminal trespass, disorderly conduct, loitering or prowling at nighttime, presenting false ID to law enforcement, or having possession of a controlled substance, if that is a sexually exploited child, the charges cannot be brought. That child has to be diverted into the child protective, under the child protective services law and treated as, as someone who is a victim of a crime and not ultimately prosecuted. I think it's really important to understand that. Again, how it empowers state agencies. DHS is mandated to create a statewide protocol to effectively coordinate the service provision. We engaged on, um, with DHS. To, to create the protocols, all 67 county DHS or children and youth organizations should have those policies and protocols. They also have to develop specialized services, including you know, safe and stable housing, access to education, a whole host of things that we know child victims of sex trafficking need, and that all um, specialized service providers have to receive sufficient training to understand you know, what goes into a child being victimized in, in the form of sex trafficking. It also enhanced law enforcement efforts. Again, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but it includes training. The Attorney General's Office now has concurrent jurisdiction over the crime of sex trafficking. Um, and then finally, a fund was created and that fund is, is populated 
by convictions and, and fines. And those are convictions of sex traffickers and those who purchase sex as well. So again, just jumping really quickly over to trauma, I think I'm preaching to the choir. I know so many service providers on here and you already have a true understanding of what trauma truly, you know, what trauma really is. But what we know about trauma, especially in our work as attorneys, solving someone's legal problems is we know that someone who's gone through a traumatic experience really doesn't process and recall memories because that filing cabinet that is the brain has you know, really not, um, things didn't get filed in the right folders, right? So if you have a memory about a Christmas morning or a summer vacation every summer, you know, like the next summer when you go or the next Christmas, your memory is going to get folded in your Christmas folder. We know when someone is undergoing a traumatic experience that it may not make it into the filing cabinet, which is your brain at all. And if it does, it might not make it into the right folder. It might be kind of sitting outside the filing cabinet, but we know that someone who has experienced trauma, we can't expect them to have, um, be able to process and recall memories um, because of that traumatic experience. We know that there are two components to a traumatic experience, the objective and the subjective. And the, the bottom line of all of this is that trauma is defined by the experience of the survivor. The core issue with trauma is that people feel unsafe in their bodies and no two people are alike. And the definition of trauma for me is very different than any of you because we're all unique. The important thing to remember is it is the experience of the person who lived through it that is what's important. It impacts all of us differently. I am not a science person by any, any means, but we know that the neurological basis of trauma is again, how things you know, work in our brain. And our brain is an amazing piece of our anatomy and it is hardwired for us to survive. That is what's most important. So our, the thinking part of our brain during a traumatic experience gets shut off because that part of our brain, I call it the reptilian brain, is solely focused on getting us through the trauma. That's why memories don't necessarily make it all the way into the filing cabinet or get in the wrong file. So just remember that our thinking brain that codes our memories and where they're supposed to go shuts off for the sole purpose of keeping us alive. And that I think is what is, is just so brilliant uh, about our brains and survival. We know that trauma affects and alters reality, that people who are undergoing traumatic experiences on a daily basis, they change their definition of normal for the purpose of survival. I've talked about memories, right? Details, they don't remember them. Or when they're talking about the details, they present, you know, with a flat affect, or they're unable to recall things all together. Just please remember, not to misinterpret inconsistencies as evasive or lying, and gaps could get filled in later. We can't expect our clients to tell us what happened with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It might start at the end and go to the middle and go back to the end. It's just a different way of listening and learning from our clients, right? We can't expect a story to have a linear, um, be linear in fashion. Come on. We know that traffickers really do condition their victims through starvation, through confinement, isolation, physical abuse, torture, rape, threats of violence to family members, denial of medical care or medications. You know, there's a perceived inability to escape, being forced to give up custody of children, being forced to participate in acts of violence against other victims and humiliation. So, in addition to sex trafficking victims being forced you know, into commercial sex act, we know that traffickers are also engaging in this type of activity. We know that complex traumatic events and experiences are repetitive, prolonged, cumulative. They occur most often in interpersonal types of relationships that involve direct harm, exploitation, and maltreatment, and occur at developmentally, developmentally vulnerable times. When I have worked throughout, you know, my 20 plus year career as an attorney with child victims, 
um, some of those maladaptive behaviors that that children, ex, you know, it, it could explosive type of reactions that don't necessarily fit the, the moment. Um, I have to remind myself that the client isn't angry at me. I might be a proxy, especially if they explode or hang up on you. That ability to survive that comes out as that explosion or that rage, um, it's just that switch is just always on. It doesn't turn off and turn on all the time. So we all have to remind ourselves that as professionals, it isn't about us. And I always have to lean into the fact that, the you know, um, a rage type of reaction is something that's good, right? It's what allow the survivor during their time of victimization to survive, right? So just, you know, kind of rethink the way um, that we do about our interactions with our clients. Why should we adopt a trauma-informed practice? Um, we know it results in more trusting relationships. Those more trusting relationships lead to better results. We know that social service providers have a responsibility to mitigate stigma and stereotypes. And we know that this type of approach encourages self-care to mitigate vicarious trauma that we could all experience. If I don't bring myself best self to work every day, I'm not gonna be the best lawyer for my clients. So I have to make sure that I do take care of myself. And we have to walk alongside of our clients, you know, during traumatic events, including prosecutions, which are re-triggering and re-traumatizing. And I think, you know, are a whole new trauma in themselves. Come on. We know that clients can be unreliable or erratic in their communications. Their stories do change over time. I think of it as an evolution. We, again, clients can be volatile and you have to be really careful that you take care of yourself and people who work with you or for you that, you know, they're not experiencing burnout. We know that clients um, have a mistrust. It's pervasive. They could be completely manipulative or dishonest. And again, that's a way that they adapted in order to survive. We know that trauma bonding can be very strong. Um, and that the maladaptive behaviors, clients can relapse, and that's something that we need to safety plan for. So how do you work with the client? We work on the five core values of trauma-informed care of social work. We start with physical and emotional safety. And if someone is not in a physical safe space to go to when they leave our office, or even in an emotional place, we just stop. We don't go into you know, the history or doing you know, gathering information to solve the legal problem. We focus solely on making sure that our clients are safe and we work with the community of support that we've built for our clients. We ensure that um, trustworthiness is not something we ever say to our clients. You have to trust us. We have attorney client privilege. You have to trust us. It's something that they give to us and we have to earn it, right? So being clear in expectations, providing consistent service delivery, maintaining boundaries is really important. Choice right? Our clients drive the bus and it's ultimately our advice that they can take or not take, but um, we give them the choice and hopefully the ability to make the choices, re re you know, regarding their, their legal issues. And this applies both to social service issues, you know, as well. We collaborate with our clients. They're part of the team. We work for them. And it's really important that they feel as though they are part of this process. And at the end of it, we know that the criminal legal system has not something that's been friendly to our clients. And so we're hopeful by the end of the, you know, their legal process of solving a legal problem for them, whether or not we're walking alongside them during a prosecution, that they feel empowered and not beaten down by the system. We know that without a sense of safety, our clients aren't gonna progress. We know that the anxiety and stress it creates is gonna to add to new trauma, amplify old trauma and impact their behavior that emerges as unhealthy and maladaptive. You know, this gets played long after any physical threat is gone. So what are some best practices? These are our best practices that we've come up with. We make sure that our, our clients don't have to tell their story over and over again. We try to be aware of symptoms of psychological distress. It's been really hard the last couple of years over Zoom. You can't see if someone's fidgeting their feet or picking their fingernails. Um, we never make blame statements. We avoid white questions. 
um, we help them process. And a lot of our clients who do have are in recovery from substance use disorder, we we talk very candidly like about safety planning if there is a relapse. And we're hopeful that at the end that those who were a victim of crime, you know, during the time they were being trafficked can serve, you know, see themselves as a survivor. And then if they choose to, we can help them on the path to, to leadership in addition to other professional functions that they do. It's really important to change your perspective, define your role, stick with that, maintain the boundary, monitor expectations with your client, be clear on the timeline, next steps, actively listen, validate, acknowledge your client's experiences, identify other barriers to justice, build a community of support that you are seeing that your client may need. And again, here are some practice tips. You know, allow space for your client or the person you're working with to have autonomy. Um, don't assume that your client wants to change. Make sure that their notion of safety is their notion of safety, not yours. If a client chooses not to change, um, don't think of that as a failure. We need to really redefine how we look at, at success. Be really careful in your language choices. Don't say things like, you can do this for me, right? Um, be really self-aware. It's all of us are humans. We want to be liked. What's more important is that you do a good job, right? Um, and please let's stay away from possessive terms, right? Like I know I was a prosecutor for 10 years and cases I refer to like my witnesses, my cops, my judge, my public defender. We need to really step away from that because it helps. Um, we don't own any other person and it's also sort of like that parallel type of behavior. So we need to be really careful that we don't use possessive terms. Um, build rapport, build rapport, define your role, explain what you can do, explain what you cannot do. Assess your client's safety with them as a participant in that, as well as their social service needs. Be aware of collateral concerns. As, you know, and if you're going to make referrals, try to make sure that they are affordable, if not free and trauma informed. Know who to talk with, where to refer people, build your network. Be really careful with your language and cultural competency we use technical legal terms, we explain them. Slang may help our clients feel more comfortable. Avoid using words like rescue, child prostitute, obviously there's no such thing. We talk about substance use disorder. Don't look at, you know, use the term criminal. We tailor our word choice to our clients' age, abilities, and background, and we really do practice cultural humility. Make sure you maintain confidentiality. In a, if you're working with children and you're a child advocate, make sure you're working in their best interests. Be part of the empowering process. Be professional, maintain your boundaries and check your power and your privilege. It's really important. And I only went three minutes over, Suzanne, I'm so sorry. No, you're good. Thank you so much. We appreciate the presentation. And I tried to fly. <laughs> I know it was, it's a lot in the short amount of time, but just everybody be reminded you will receive a copy of the PowerPoint and have access to all that information. So thank you so much. And then if you have questions for Shay, make sure you get those in the chat so that we can address those during the panel discussion. Um, before we move to our next presenters, we just want to show you some of the information that we have developed as part of this grant. Go ahead, uh, Renee, you can share that screen. These are some of the uh, flyers and posters that are available. It's gonna come up momentarily and like uh, you will receive an electronic format to them, but if you would like printed copies of the materials, um, we have the poster, um, the sex trafficking, the guide for service providers, caregivers, and for teens. If you would like to see receive hard copies of any of these materials, just uh, make sure you let us know and our contact information will be in the chat where you could email us and ask for some of this to be mailed to you in 
printed form. I also want to thank people for typing in your locations where you're um, listening to us from. That's helpful. We're so glad to see people from all across the Commonwealth participating. I'm also going to ask if you've seen one of the billboards that sex trafficking happens here in your community, please type that in the chat and let us know that you've actually seen one of the billboards from across the Commonwealth. And now we're going to move on to our next presenters. Our next presenters are from Mission Kids. Uh, that's Abby Newman and Michelle McDyer. Abby is the Chief Executive Officer of Mission Kids Child Advocacy Center of Montgomery County. Abby is a lawyer and a nurse and leads an exceptional team of advocates at the Child Advocacy Center. Their team is known for their successful collaborative efforts and multidisciplinary team approach to investigating and preventing child abuse. When we approached them about this project, they responded and went into action quickly, sharing and developing resources and creating a social media presence. Um, Michelle McDyer is the Director of Prevention, Education and Outreach at Mission Kids. Michelle is an experienced trainer and resource developer. Her passion for the work is contagious. She's a zealous advocate and a valuable team member. Please welcome Abby and Michelle. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and thank you for having Mission Kids as part of this project. Um, I speak on behalf of both myself, Michelle, and everybody at Mission Kids that we are truly grateful to have been selected. And we really very much appreciate the recognition of the work that we attempt to do and try to do every day regarding commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, for everybody there, I'm the CEO of Mission Kids in Montgomery County. My background very briefly is both I'm a registered nurse and an attorney, and I've been privileged to be with Mission Kids since 2008. Michelle, do you just wanna briefly introduce yourself so when we get to your portion, we can just move right in? Michelle? Suzanne, can you hear me? I want to make sure that I, I'm being heard. Sorry, I was on mute. Oh, that's all right. Sorry. There we go. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle McDyer. I am the Director of Prevention, Education, and Outreach at Mission Kids Child Advocacy Center. I started here um, seven years ago in a direct service role, and now I oversee our prevention, education, and outreach efforts. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like here in Montgomery County and at a statewide level. Thanks, Michelle. We're going to talk and give you a very brief overview because like Shay's presentation, we really could go on and, and often we'll do a two hour presentation on what it was that led Mission Kids to developing this um, expanded multidisciplinary team response to CSEC. And we're using CSEC as the acronym for Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. Um, and also very briefly what that response looks like in Montgomery County. Before I start, I want to make sure I believe everybody on the call knows how a child advocacy center works, but I want to make absolutely clear about that. A child advocacy center, which is found in 42 of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania, works um, with team members to respond to child sexual abuse. So in these centers, when there is a report, um, an allegation of child sexual abuse, the police, the social workers, the advocates will all do their own investigations and support the victims. But when it comes to interviewing that child, they all step back and they bring that child to the Child Advocacy Center for a forensic interview. That forensic interview is done in an age appropriate, open ended fashion with the CYS worker, law enforcement, and prosecutor watching live from another, room, from another room. So they get the benefits of that live interview without re traumatizing the child with numerous interviews um, and numerous questions. We also refer for appropriate mental health and medical examinations for these children. And we break down the silos that will respond otherwise with child sexual abuse. Ch commercial sexual exploitation of children, let's be very clear, it is a form of child sexual abuse and at its core, it's child rape when we get right down to it. So these are cases which in my opinion should be going through the child advocacy center. Next slide. Okay. So the need that we had at Mission Kids and what we saw is that there were and there still are not any standardized responses to CSEC in Pennsylvania. We know that victims, especially of child um, of CSEC cases, will cross borders. We saw that our kids would run from Montgomery County into Philadelphia, and then it became, if we were not really working with them with a better response, difficult to locate these children. 
and, and we know that within 72 hours of running, a child is likely to be approached by somebody on behalf of a trafficker. We didn't, and we still don't have any idea how many CSEC cases there are in Pennsylvania. Several years ago, Penn State University tried to determine how many sex trafficking cases there were of minor victims in Pennsylvania. And they were looking at 10 rural, rural counties across the state. They needed to halt their research because they found that these cases were so misidentified over and over again that their research in that regard was not going to be valuable. Um, and what need did we see? We had a forensic interview that went really badly regarding a trafficking victim. And I won't go into, into depth because it doesn't matter. This was a case where an adolescent was found in the back seat of a car, two men in the front seat, she was in lingerie, it was late at night, there was no good reason for any reason that these three individuals should be together, there was no identification. And so it was pretty clear to everybody involved that this child was being sold. So we followed our usual protocol at the Child Advocacy Center, which is everybody step back, let us come and interview this child, and we will treat them with kid gloves um, and as quickly as possible, all right? That's what we do in our other child sexual abuse cases. And frankly, it's an approach that is evidence-based and works very well. Well, this child, as you can imagine, got her in as soon as possible, no wraparound for anything. That child, the interviewer sat down, standard approach. Hi, my name is, and I work with kids who somebody might be worried about their safety. Is somebody worried about your safety? You can imagine up yours, I'm not talking, I whatever I did, I did because I wanted to, I'm not giving you any names. It went very badly. And it was a recorded interview. The district attorney that was there was frankly appropriately apoplectic because this is now a recorded statement on behalf of this child. It was very difficult to work through. But what we all understood, we had a strong team and everybody calmed down, is that we knew that for these cases, we had to find a better way. And then we had an opportunity when a stop grant came up to apply for that grant and specifically fund finding a better way in Montgomery County. And so we jumped at it and we were very lucky that we were awarded that grant. So I wanna tell you the end of the story first for what happened once we got that grant. This graph shows the suspected sex trafficking victims who were served by mission kids. Um, if you look back 2016, 2017, we were suspecting a few cases per year. In 2018, we started really writing this application for the grant. You can see we started recognizing or suspecting a few more victims. We received that grant. We started working very closely as an expanded team. In 2019, and you can see that it jumped up to 16 suspected cases. 2020 and 2021, we began incubating and tweaking those policies more. And you can see how the number of, sus of suspected CSEC cases recognized in Montgomery County jumped. I wanna emphasize that these are suspected cases of CSEC. Some of them don't have a lot of evi enough evidence to be prosecuted with a lot of red flags. But what I will emphasize is that we don't know, even with that, how many kids maybe we have prevented from entering the life or how many we have been helping without being able to absolutely prove beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt in court that they are in the life. In terms of the case breakdown of the cases that we've seen, there's no majority, all of them are different. There can be multiple victims in cases. We've had cases of parents selling their kids in the opioid crisis for money. Some of them are pimp involved, and so those are often taken by the FBI or Homeland Security for investigation. But uh, we try to stay on in those cases um, to provide advocacy, uh, victim advocacy and mental health and medical services. We have a few cases of kids exchanging sex on their own or suspected to be. And those are difficult because we know that either we just haven't been able to determine who's behind it or what trauma that child has gone through to put herself in that situation. But we also know that in those cases, the fire is coming up. We have cases of CSAM, child sexual abuse materials, previously known as child pornography. And these kids are manipulated to get images in exchange for something. And when that is happening, there's an exchange of money or something of value that comes under the trafficking laws. Either way, we know that it's child sexual exploitation and it's the people who are buying the images who are at fault. Next. Okay. So why the Child Advocacy Center as the facilitator for this grant and for the response? The Child Advocacy Center is a natural fit due to the ingrained multidisciplinary team response that we have, plus partner and community buy-in. We know that this is a complex um, area that needs a complex approach 
of both public, private, and nonprofits working together, and that this MDT in the CSEC response is an amplified CAC response. And we know that CSEC can only be tackled by all aspects of, commu of the community working together. And so on our team, when we started working on our CSEC response, you can see in the bold up on the top left, those are your typical agencies that are involved in every child advocacy center. You have the CAC, the district attorney's office, law enforcement, we have 50 jurisdictions in Montgomery County, plus the state police and county detectives, CYS, mental health and medical. We added to that team, FBI, Homeland Security, juvenile probation, volunteer child lawyers that we have in our county, many of you might have GALs, a juvenile judge, a media representative to help us get our word out to the community, which is why we were so gratified when OVA asked us to work on the, um, the, the billboard campaign in Pennsylvania, a grant manager and a point person, a survivor leader, Tammy, um, I'm, I know that you're on the call, thank you for everything that you contributed to our work on this. Rape Crisis Center and Domestic Violence Agency and Shelter, as well as a lot of community-based nonprofits. If any of you have a Salvation Army in your county, they are a wealth of information. LGBTQIA plus service agencies and nonprofits for immigrants and refugees, because we know that these minorities are often more vulnerable to traffickers. In our area, we had a nonprofit serving the Latinx community as well. Missing, um, one second, it's missing is a dedicated shelter for minors. We're still struggling with that. And I know that many areas in Pennsylvania are struggling as well. So we're open to suggestions for that if anybody has any. Okay, yeah, next. Okay, just very quickly, we did, as we were developing, we look at protocols from all over the count of the country to see what other people were doing, what was working and how they could best be adapted for Montgomery County. And the policies that we came up with under this grant were specifically meant to be replicated across Pennsylvania. I'm not sure when they're going up on PCCD's website, but you can contact them or we're happy to provide them with you if you wanna contact us afterwards. We also worked with Polaris, which is the national reporting hotline that they were very much a wealth of information for us. And Marlene Parson and the Switch out in Ohio, survivor-led group. There was also an advisory group that was helpful in reviewing our protocols that they were, as they were developed including PCCB, PCAR, PCADB, and Villanova CSE Institute leaders. Next. Our early takeaways from this are that this is a problem CSEC can only be tackled by coordinated community response using an expanded MDT model. As Shea said, it's gotta be trauma-informed and a victim-centered response is the key. The child needs to trust you and your team. You need to learn to trust you and your team instead of their traveler. You have to make sure that that response is culturally appropriate for the victim and including LGBTQIA and disabled um, who are at higher risk and minority and immigrant communities. A shift to seeing adult prostituted persons as victims and not criminals. So it was important that we were developing responses both for children and for adults in the community. As we were working on the child responses, it was really helpful to have these adult providers at the table. They were able to give us insight because we know that a lot of these victims will enter the life when they are adolescents, but they may not be identified until they're adults. And so the adult service groups were able to inform what we were doing. We also know that because of the brain and how it works, that development will stop with the trauma at that age. So you could have a 14 year old and that's who was first traumatized by trafficking in CSET. That's where the developing stops, but they may end up walking into an adult agency. Or conversely, you can have a 16 year old who walks into an adult agency for help, but says that she's 19 because her trafficker has said and threatened everything that would happen if they knew that she was actually a minor. And also words matter. So we talked about prostitute to prostituted person. And that's because in our county, and we know, even though prostitution, as Jay was telling you, is, may still be a crime under the law, that these, these individuals are victims. And the language that we use in that regard will trickle down to how we see juvenile victims as well. When you have a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old sitting in front of you who is lashing out and who could be seen as really an adult because of a physical appearance, but remembering they are not adults. And so that language shift 
and not prosecuting adults in that situation are very important. Another um, example of words mattering is not using the term child pornography, but instead child sexual abuse materials so that there is no indication whatsoever that there is any consent or anything that is not totally illegal, wrong, and traumatizing about child, about using images of children in a sexual way, which is really just evidence that abuse has taken place. I'm looking at the time, I'm sorry if I'm talking a little quickly. Okay, so the multidisciplinary team response, as we said, has to be trauma-informed from the first contact, understanding the child's histories and multiple systems, and slowing down that process. So at a child advocacy center, as I was saying, the objective generally with a child sex abuse case, if it is a neighbor, a coach, is to get that child in as quickly as, as possible so that we can start providing services for that child as quickly as possible. In this case, and with the example that I gave you, you do not want to just rush a potential trafficking CSEC victim into a forensic interview. The process has to be slowed down. The team has to meet. You have to really understand what has been going on as best as you're able to with that child and make sure that that child, that adolescent is ready before you bring them in for a forensic interview. And that could be knowing their, their history, trauma history, truancy, mental health needs, and other red flags. And it may be that that child doesn't get a forensic interview. And in those cases that you do a forensic interview, it's not finding out the evidence as it is in other child sexual abuse cases. But at that time, maybe it's a recording of the evidence because that child has been able to slowly gain trust and tell different parts of it to different people that she has now bonded, he or she has bonded with on that team. And it might be law enforcement or the victim advocate or a social worker. And so it's again, just meeting that child where they are and slowing down the process. Okay, so step one, how do you respond? Obviously, as we've been talking about, the identification piece is really key. How did we address that? We increased it through discussions among the expanded MDT members that we had on our team. Um, we were all able to sit down and discuss when all of them individually were seeing these cases. And that way it, in, it increased the understanding of the different agencies as they looked outside of their silos, what other parts of the community and other agencies were seeing and hearing with victims. We did a lot of education of our multidisciplinary team partners from many different sources. And we developed um, identification tools and that made it helpful for CYS in our county to start to look at identifying these children as victims, especially from the ungovernable unit, as we've been talking about kids lashing out and responding to their trauma in that regard. And the education also helped combat common misconceptions of trauma. We developed for identification a red flags part, um, and these were specifically made to be carried by law enforcement and CYS. Often, the signs of trafficking can be mistaken as just a normal response. Somebody who might be fearful or anxious or depressed. Well, we also know that this type of behavior and if submissive and if there's no ID, um, maybe you see somebody's had multiple uh, STIs or pregnancies or abortions. They're accompanied by an adult with this and not allowed to speak for themselves. Um, and sometimes they're branding. Now, and I'm not talking about a regular tattoo, but branding may be a dollar sign with somebody's name to it. But all this information was there and you can see it on the red flags part and we're happy to provide it to anybody who wants it um, to help the first responders that might be encountering these victims. And with it on the flip side of the card at their fingertips are the phone numbers for them to reach and to get to in case they need to contact them. Next. We also developed a trifold and safety planning part. Um, and we got this idea from an a detective on the team and victim service providers on the team who the detective told us that she would sometimes use a napkin at a diner to write down her contact information. And having something as simple and tangible as a trifold and safety planning part like this for the survivor use would feel would be very helpful for the survivor and for the victim and giving to them, again, on the flip side, numbers that they can call if and when they thought that they were ready. Next. 
we developed a human trafficking poster. This was a very survivor informed work product um, with help from the Salvation Army. They gave us access to their survivor informed team who very much helped and gave us feedback on the poster. Uh, we made sure that it had multiple ways to access information for survivors if they came across this poster and a QR code for them uh, to be able to go immediately to the website and so that we could measure the traction on the website as well. Uh, we made sure with feedback from the survivors to make sure that there was nothing that could be identifiable in the, the figures on the poster because we know that victims come in all shapes, sizes, nationalities, sexes, gender identification. And we wanted to make sure that somebody didn't look at that poster and say, oh, that's not me. And so as you can tell, everything is shaded, blurred. It could be anybody. So hopefully a victim may feel like, oh, maybe this is me. Um, COVID did put, unfortunately put a snag in rolling it out and now we've given them to our partners and hopefully we will be able to see that they will make contact. Okay, next is the child line report. After there's a report of suspicion of trafficking, I think everybody should know this. Um, this has got to be called into child line. Um, please try to educate child line as you do this. We keep getting numerous reports. The child line does not necessarily understand what a CSAF case is. Hearing some of the vaguer symptoms may say, oh no, this is GPS and not CPS. Um, if you make a call and you're getting that indication, I would suggest that you call the district attorney's office directly to make sure that that report is actually flat. Next step, MDT notification and initial response. What we do differently in Montgomery County with these responses is that when, when either law enforcement or the Office of Children and Youth um, believe that they may have a CSEC victim, they immediately will contact our CSEC case coordinator and advocate to talk about that case and hopefully start setting the gears in motion. At the Office of Children and Youth, they will perform their DHS screening. This is done on every child in Montgomery County. Um, for those of you from CYS, the tools that uh, are used in your county are done at your county's discretion. There is no one tool that is being used. Um, in Montgomery County, the tool that we use again is done on every child so that we try to have as many potential identifications as possible. The caseworker as well, if they suspect CSEC, will call our case coordinator and advocate directly at Mission Kids, um, at which point we will then assign it for a case assessment, uh, the, a, another type of tool which we can get into at a later time if you're so interested. Um, there's got to be a lot of open communication between partners and we have partners calling our case coordinator and advocate all the time saying, gee, I have this case, what do you think is this one that I should be calling in? And it's been working very well. Step four, um, after that, this our coordinator and advocate, that is her only job because she is an advocate that works with these suspected victims. She will immediately begin rapport building with the child and connecting the child with services, housing, employment, and other tangible items that might be needed, clothing, um, making sure that, that they're in a safe place. She will go and visit that child at the shelter, at the youth shelter, if that's where they are. She makes sure to notify the team of allegations within 24 hours. They determine whether a CSEC response team meeting should occur within 72 business hours. And again, she notifies our case sector, whose case assessor, who is a mental health provider to conduct that CSEC assessment. Um, again, this is something that if you wanna go into more detail with us at a, at a later time, we're happy to do with you. Finally, uh, there are the CSEC MDT meeting. It says singular here, but it is actually plural. It depends on when that child is, is located. It depends on what's going on with that child and meeting that child in that trauma-informed manner. The meeting will take place, as I said, in the hours on the five that we just talked about. Often at this point, it's done by Zoom or telephone call, which is what we found we was enough for us. The team reviews the allegations, agrees upon a plan for services, investigation, and welfare that can include placement and shelter, mental health treatment, making sure that child is safe from an alleged perp or another individual, medical evaluation in healthcare, and again, the timing of that forensic interview. Is that child ready to speak to that team? If a case, for whatever reason, does not have this team meeting within 72 hours, it will ask to be reviewed quarterly when we have our CSEC case reviews. I know that I am out of time at this point, Thank you all for listening. We're happy to talk more in detail and answer questions at the end. 
And over to you, Michelle, to talk about the awareness plan. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so if there's any exciting point of all of this, I know it's a lot of heavy material. We can all take a deep breath, but this is the empowering part. Um, we were very excited that there was funding behind an awareness campaign. As someone who specializes in education and prevention and awareness, um, we were thrilled to join this campaign. So on June 1st, we launched a statewide campaign that focused on awareness surrounding the sexual exploitation of children. Our overall goal here was to develop and distribute these tools that would ultimately assist parents, teachers, and service providers to recognize the signs of child sex trafficking and also expose the predatory nature of offenders. Um, I I think it really resonated with me earlier when Anastasia said that she knew that what was happening to her was wrong, but she didn't really know what was happening was child sex trafficking. So it was really great that we had funding um, and support behind this awareness campaign. So um, as a team, I do want to give recognition to Alexia Tomlinson, Mary Haggerty from uh, Villanova, and then to Hannah Cornell from Mission Kids. We really, as a team, jumped in and worked on what do we want our messaging to be? So we focused on dispelling myths associated with child sex trafficking, and we also wanted to um, really share how people can access these resources. So there's not this stigma or a lot of unknowns about what to do if you suspect sex trafficking or if you find yourself in a vulnerable position or if you're worried about a friend. So throughout this campaign, uh, we created billboards and then there were ads on Spotify and iHeartRadio. So I'm going to walk you quickly through what that looks like. Um, here is one of our billboard campaigns. I think we got this picture from Pittsburgh. Um, so it's that shock value. It's kind of alarming to see that sex trafficking happens here. There's billboards across the state. Here's some other photos that we have. Um, it was cool to see these images come in. We saw them in rural areas. We saw them in suburban areas. And then we also saw them in urban areas. Um, so again, just let us know in the chat box, where have you seen these and what was your initial interpretation? What we wanted to do was let people know that sex trafficking happens here, right here in Pennsylvania. And we knew that we needed a call to action. We originally wanted to do a website, but we thought that would be really hard for someone who's driving down I-95 or 422 for them to pull over and write down the name of a website. So our goal was to draw awareness via social media. Um, and we think that that has worked out pretty well because again, that is where people are spending time. That's where they're, gather they're gathering resources and information and it's easily accessible at their fingertips. Um, so we do have a link tree. If you're familiar with link tree, you can pull up your phone and use the QR code so that you can see all of our different social media resources that we've used. Um, so you can use, again, that QR code, or you can see right here, we are on um, Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we are on Twitter. I do encourage you all right now to take out your smartphones, pull this up, and follow us on social media. We know that awareness is key. What we wanted to do was grab people's attention um, and then bring them, guide them to our social media pages where we have a slew of information and resources. Um, so, you know, I pulled these numbers yesterday around 6 p.m., but our reach has been pretty big. On Facebook, we've reached around 64,000 people. On Instagram, it's been a little bit less, around 446 people, but we've had a lot of engagement on Instagram, particularly on our Instagram stories. And then on Twitter, we've had about 1,700 impressions. Um, so it's really cool to see that people are actually seeing those billboards and then they're searching us on social media, either by the Trafficking Happens PA handle or by using our hashtags that we created. Um, this is some of the social media content that we created. Again, if you go and follow us, you will see all of this, but we really wanted to kind of dispel some of the myths. So if you've heard of like the Wayfair scandal or one of these um, other misconceptions of someone saying that sex traffic traffickers are using abandoned car seats to lure victims, we wanted to really put that out there and then in the caption really explain what's going on there. Um, and then we integrated other resources 
throughout our social media campaign so that people could reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline if they were worried about someone or if they themselves needed help. I wanted to show this because I thought this was interesting. Obviously, I blurred out the identifying characteristics, but someone actually tweeted at us saying, I thought this was a strange billboard, but now I understand it's to raise awareness. So someone actually hopefully safely pulled over, but took a picture of our billboard. So it resonated with the person. They then found us on social media and they were able to access resources and information about our campaign that way. I also wanted to share this because we did receive some messaging about the word sex trafficking happens here. So some people thought, whoa, that's shocking that happens here. But a marketing professional actually direct messaged us and I communicated back and forth a couple of times. And they said, what about saying sex trafficking stops here? So halfway through the month of June, we changed some of our uh, messaging to show this where um, what we're trying to say is that sex trafficking does happen here, but it also stops here. And in the captions and in our other messaging, we shared resources and ways that people can get involved and help stop sex trafficking here. So I think it's just cool to see that we've been engaging with the community, um, getting feedback from them about the campaign, and then really tailoring our messages to ways that people um, that would resonate with them and that wants them to get involved. As Suzanne mentioned earlier, we do have tangible items. So this is a trifold card that we created for teenagers specifically. So you can see it's bright colors, it's things that resonate with teenagers. I'm still thinking back to Anastasia's story to what if there had been something like this that was distributed at school or um, at the mall or at the library, like different places where teenagers are, our first thought was like Wawa and Sheets across Pennsylvania. That's an easily accessible point. Um, but what it shows is the truth about sex trafficking. So we really wanted to do some uh, myth busting over here. Then we said, if you want some help, do you have questions? Do you need to talk? Here are some resources that you can use. Uh, we also showed what sex trafficking might look like. A lot of times kids and teenagers don't look at their own situation as exploitive, but if they had a friend who was in a similar situation, situation, they might say, oh, this is the advice that I would give my friend, or this is a situation that I could recognize in a friend. So we shared that on this part. Um, and then we really, I think Shay spoke a lot to um, what something of value could look, look like. It's not always an exchange of money, but it's an exchange of anything of value. Um, and then we gave a QR code here and encouraged um, following on social media. It also gave social media tools um, something that resonated me again was that Shay said, the internet is the new street corner. So we know that this is where kids are spending time, but it's also where traffickers are spending time. So we need to share that social media safety tools. We also created guides for service providers, as you can see, and then also for caregivers. So the beginning of this presentation was very heavy into what sex trafficking is, what the laws surrounding it are. But if you really break it down, caregivers, service providers, teachers, coaches, advocates, what they need to do is be able to recognize children who are vulnerable and who might be in a vulnerable situation and help them access resources. We really wanna reduce the stigma around this and let them know there are resources out there. It's a well-oiled machine. And if you come forward for help, there are people who can support you. Um, PennDOT has been a great partner. Now they have digital advertisements at the DMV, at the driver's license centers, and um, that has our messaging surrounding the campaign. Like I mentioned before, there's also ads on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Um, I think when we talked to OVA yesterday, they said that during the first half of June, over 100,000 listeners were reached via Spotify. So we're estimating that around 200,000 people will be reached on Spotify by the end of June. And then we'll get our numbers in um, from iHeartRadio at the end of the month. So this is really just sparking an interest, reducing stigma and getting people to really get involved and help stop trafficking here in Pennsylvania. Again, here's a, a link tree. You can use the QR code to do this, but we do encourage everyone to take your phone out, 
follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then you can also use the PCCD website where they house all of the resources so that you can download them. And Ashley put her um, contact information in the chat box before, but you can reach out to her if you would like these resources. And I think you can really all get involved in helping us um, to help distribute these materials and get others involved in this. Um, here's our contact information. If you have any questions for Abby or myself, if you want more information about Mission Kids, here's our QR code. And I really hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Please reach out to us at any time if you have ideas or if you want to get more involved. I think the more people, the better. It really does take a village. So I thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Michelle and Abby. It's so um, exciting to hear about the power of collaboration when you say the numbers of people who are engaging with this campaign and who are reaching out. I'm so happy to hear that. And we want this to continue. Like we're saying, it's just the beginning of the conversation, but I hope that even this beginning um, helps us all to see that we really do together have the power to make some significant changes. Okay, up next, our final presenter before the panel discussion is from the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board. Dr. Stacy Geinson is a psychologist and is the clinical, clinical director of the Pennsylvania Sexual Offenders Assessment Board. Prior to making, uh, taking the role on as a clinical director, she was a board member for over a decade conducting sexually violent predator risk assessment evaluations. Um, she's done research and clinical work with individuals convicted of sexual offenses for over 20 years. Welcome, Dr. Geinson. Hi, everyone. Um, in addition, I also may have some co-presenters, and um, they're not the quiet kind. So if there happens to be like a mailman or a bird or a leaf, um, you may hear from my co-presenters. One of them is right here. Just a heads up. All right, let me figure out how to share my screen. Jonicky, you're on, right? Yep, I'm here if you need me. Okay, all right. Podcast and all right. Okay, can everybody see this? I know I'm just trying to get it to the presentation part. Yep, we can see your screen, Stace. All right. <clears throat> so my technology skills are not that good. And um, how, okay, slideshow. Got it. But it's not working. Okay, well, I'm just going to talk then. So <clears throat> today, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Pennsylvania's sex offender registration laws. And we'll talk about how these relate to um, trafficking offenses. Um, and I'm going to start with an overview of SORNA, which is the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Um, in 2006, the federal Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act was signed by President Bush in July of 2006. And <clears throat> SORNA is Title I of that federal Adam Walsh Act. And what had happened before that is that every state had sort of its own laws related to sex offender registration and notification. And the goal of the federal Adam Walsh Act was to address the inconsistencies across the states and to create a more uniform standard for sex offender registry requirements. In Pennsylvania, we had Megan's Law beginning in 1996. And Megan's law gave <clears throat> people convicted of a subset of sex offenses, either 10 year or lifetime registration that was based on the crime of conviction. In 2012, Pennsylvania enacted the state's own version of the federal Adam Walsh Act and SORNA. And this was done um, to comply with the federal mandate. Basically we had to do it or we were gonna face financial penalties and this new law replaced and made several changes to the existing Megan's Law in Pennsylvania. Oh, this is so annoying. Okay. So 
The changes to Megan's Law in SORNA, the Adam Walsh Act, were instead of having a 10-year or on the lifetime registration, it created a tier system. So tier one offenses, and these are all based on the, the offense of conviction. Tier one carries a 15 year period of registration. <clears throat> tier two carries a 25 year registration. And tier three is lifetime registration. And sort of added on to that is the sexually violent predator piece, which I will get to in a minute. Um, registration begins at the time of sentencing, <clears throat> not at release from incarceration. And in addition to these changes in registration, there, was, there were several new crimes that were added to the existing list of offenses that require registration. So it was <clears throat> pretty significantly expanded. And in addition to registration, um, <clears throat> there are also new crimes added to those that receive assessments by the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board. Here is a list of some of the new offenses. And they included a sexually related corruption of minors, false imprisonment of a minor when the offender is not a victim's parent. This is one that can sometimes create headaches for us because when there's no sexual component, but that's for another day. Um, indecent assault without the victim's um, consent or with certain ages, institutional sexual assault, interference with custody of children, invasion of privacy, statutory sexual assault, and unlawful restraints of a minor where the offender is not the victim's parent. So most relevant to this presentation today is trafficking in minors and <clears throat> SORNA requirements related to trafficking offenses. Trafficking in individuals is a felony of the first degree if the person recruits, entices, solicits, et cetera, um, <clears throat> if the person knows or rec recklessly disregards that the individual will be subject to sexual servitude or if somebody benefits financially. And then we have trafficking in minors where a person violates the above provisions and the violation results in a minor being subjected to sexual servitude. Or this is part of the course of conduct subjecting minors to sexual servitude. Trafficking in minors was not added to Pennsylvania sex offender registration laws until 2016. Um, legally, it's a tier two offense. And individuals convicted in, of trafficking in minors will receive a 25 year registration requirement. Um, in the past five or six years, we have seen, we have received 18 cases and assessed 18 cases for, um, to see if they meet criteria for sexually violent predator. And of those 18 cases, two were found to meet criteria for sexually violent predators based on those offenses and the individual's history of offending behavior. And in a little bit, when I talk about the definition of SVP, I can certainly speak to why it's so seemingly low. Some other changes to Pennsylvania's sex offender registration law were made in 2018. Um, as you can imagine, there have been a lot of legal challenges to to SORNA, to Megan's Law. And in 2018, certain changes were made to ensure that these pass constitutional muster. And what happened was that two tracks were created for registration. <clears throat> SORNA was implemented in 2012. So now if somebody is, is convicted of an offense that was committed before December 20th, 2012, they will register under Megan's Law, which is the 10 years or lifetime. If the offense was committed after December 20th, 2012, then they register under the SORNA three-tier system, 15 years, 25 years, or lifetime. So again, this is related to when an offense was committed, not when the person was detected or when he or she was, was convicted. So the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board, we are a pretty small agency um, and our role is to conduct assessments of convicted sex offenders for 
we do three types of assessments, but the two that we do the most are we do assessments for the Pennsylvania Court of Common Pleas. We do sexually violent predator assessments. And we also do assessments for the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole. And <clears throat> the parole board assessments are done when an individual convicted of a sexual offense is coming up, is eligible for parole. And we do an assessment, a risk assessment that is used as part of the process in determining whether that individual should be paroled. So we have a staff at the SOAB, but our assessments are completed by a group of approximately 70 SOAB board members. These board members are appointed by their governor, serve a four year term that generally will get renewed. And SOAB board members are an independent group of professionals. We include psychologists, psychiatrists, other licensed individuals, and everybody is an expert in the assessment and treatment of sex offenders, of people convicted of sex offenses. <clears throat> Our board members are supported. We have a full-time staff of Commonwealth employees. We have an executive director, Megan Dade, the clinical director, that's me. We have a staff psychologist. We have investigators who operate out of four regions in the state. And we have a whole team of administrative assistants. So <clears throat> our SVP assessments, sexually violent predator assessments are conducted by the SOAB after conviction and before sentencing. And they have to be ordered by the court within 10 days of conviction. We have only 90 days from the date of conviction to complete the assessment and submit it to the district attorney's office. A sexually violent predator is defined as an individual convicted of one or more sexually violent offenses who has a mental abnormality or personality disorder that makes the person likely to engage in predatory sexual offenses. So the term sexually violent is defined by the statute. It doesn't necessarily contain like violence as, you know, hitting, punching weapons. It's um, <clears throat> most, of these, most of the sex offenses we see are considered sexually violent offenses just by the nature of the offense. And a mental abnormality is something that's internal that, that drives offending. So the example that we would see most often is pedophilia somebody who is a pedophile who has a long-standing attraction to children and acts on it or pedophilic disorder is <clears throat> more likely to over the course of their lifetime to engage in sex offenses sexually violent offenses than somebody who does not an example of a personality disorder that predisposes people to sexually violent offending would be antisocial personality disorder a person who has like a long-standing disregard for, oh my, sorry about my dog, um, <clears throat> for a long-standing disregard for societal norms, for the rights of others, and whose main concern is meeting his or her own needs. The mental abnormality or personality disorder has to be a lifetime condition that presents a risk of reoffending across the SVP's lifespan. So we're not looking at risk in terms of five or 10 years out. We're looking at a condition, an internal condition that presents a risk of reoffending throughout life. So what happens when a case is assigned to us, is we get a court order and the case gets assigned to an investigator. The investigator, Bruno, can it? The investigator conducts a comprehensive personal and criminal background check of the, <coughs> of the offender. They collect records from everywhere, really whatever they can get. They reach out to education, to jobs. Um, they'll make collateral contacts with individuals. So we do never contact, we do never contact the victim. Um, so they'll talk to people who may have relevant information. The offender is always offered an interview and they will interview the offender if he or she and his or her attorney consents. And then they prepare an investigation report for the SOAB board member. So there's a written report <clears throat> with all of the supporting documentation. And of course they compile a complete criminal history, um, both with records from in-state, out-of-state, whatever they're able to obtain. 
the SVP assessment is completed by the board member and it is sent to, and it's reviewed by our staff psychologist, sometimes by me, just to make sure that it's adhering to best practice. And then that assessment is sent to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office decides whether or not to ask the court for an SVP hearing. Generally, if the board member finds that somebody meets criteria for SVP, the DA will ask for a hearing. Um, <clears throat> if a hearing is held, the SOAB member is called to provide expert testimony for the Commonwealth. And sometimes the defense will, <clears throat> will bring in an expert as well. And overall, I would say that board members find offenders to meet criteria for classification as an SVP approximately 25% of the time, maybe, maybe 20, 25% of the time. And usually <clears throat> the courts will agree with us in about 75% of the cases where hearings are held. What we have to do with the hearing is the Commonwealth has to prove that an offender meets the criteria for classification as a sexually violent predator by clear and convincing evidence. So we don't have to like prove it, but we have to be, we have to do a pretty good job. But ultimately it's up to the court, it's up to the judge to make the determination if somebody is classified as an SVP. And of course, the offender may appeal the SVP status, and I don't know how often that, that happens, that they're appealed. Okay, so what is different about an SVP? Regardless of whether a person classified as a sexually violent predator is a tier one, tier two, or tier three offender, <clears throat> they're automatically required to register um, for lifetime with the Pennsylvania State Police. For most people who are who register as sex offenders, you can go to like the Megan's Law website and look people up in your neighborhood and find their pictures. But for SVPs and other information about them, but for SVPs, there's active community notification. So local law enforcement authorities may notify neighbors, children and youth agencies, daycare centers, school districts, and so forth. Um, when an SVP is moving into town. They'll give the name, the address, the offense, and a photograph. And <clears throat> in fact, when my children were in preschool, I once needed to use the bathroom in the preschool and there was like a wall with the pictures of all of the SVPs hanging up. So, you know, just in case, I don't know, we saw them. So it did strike me as a little odd, but <clears throat> they were notifying the schools. And of course, there's the typical passive community notification they are listed as a sexually violent predator on the Pennsylvania Public Megan's Law website. In addition, and the part that we think is really the most helpful is that sexually violent predators are required to attend mandatory treatment for the remainder of their lives. Because we're looking at a lifetime condition that predisposes a person to sexual offending, um, and we know that these conditions can't be cured, but can be managed, they're mandated to a treatment for life so that they always have somebody helping them manage <clears throat> their mental abnormality or personality disorder. Now it says mandatory monthly counseling sessions, but that doesn't mean it's only once a month. Um, it just has to be at least once a month. And the offender, the, the treatment provider has to be someone who's approved by the SOAB. So they can't just go to anybody. They can't just like lay on the couch and talk about their mother. They have to go to a program that we've approved because of their experience in working with this population and you know, their adherence to our standards. If an SVP does not attend monthly treatment, then there are crim criminal penalties <clears throat> involved and compliance with the treatment requirement is monitored by us and by the Pennsylvania State Police. So we know which SVPs are going to which treatment providers. We get monthly reports of their sessions and how they're doing. And if they miss, then we notify the state police. So <clears throat> uh, 30 minutes is very short. Okay, in our assessment, our SOAB member has to review the investigation report. If the offender wants an interview, we have to offer it, but it's not necessary for the board member to make an SVP determination. 
and we review and analyze the various factors that are set forth in the law. And it's sort of an interesting process because we have factors that we have to consider, but there isn't one that outweighs the other. They're just looking, we just look at them in order to answer the ultimate question about whether there's a mental abnormality or personality disorder driving um, the sexual offending. So the factors that we have to con consider are <clears throat> whether the offense involved multiple victims, as that's generally a sign of greater risk-taking, possibly greater deviance, if the individual exceeded the means necessary to achieve the offense, um, what was the nature of sexual contact with the victim? What was the relationship? Were they um, father, daughter, um, related somehow, unrelated, stranger? How old was the victim? We look at whether the offense displayed, included a display of unusual cruelty. Now, all sex offenses are cruel, but we look at cruelty sort of above and beyond what is typical. Um, we look at the mental capacity of the victim. Is this someone who has cognitive limitations, significant mental illness, who's a very young age? Then the board members have to look at the person's prior offense history. So what is that individual's criminal record of both sexual and non-sexual offenses? Has this person ever successfully completed any prior sentences? And has he or she participated in sex offender treatment in the past? Next, we look at certain characteristics related to the offender. Um, how old is the offender? Is there a history of use of drugs or alcohol or drugs and alcohol use in the commission of this offense? Does the offender have any history of mental illness, mental disability or mental abnormality? And what are other behavioral characteristics that may have contributed to this individual's conduct that haven't been addressed in the other sections? And finally, our board members are asked to look at factors in this individual that are supported in the sexual offender assessment field as being related to the risk of recidivism. So some of the factors, and they're too long to go into right now, but age of the offender, prior convictions for sexual or non-sexual violence. Um, does the person have unrelated victor, stranger victims? Um, does this person have poor problem solving skills, hostility towards women? So we just do a brief overview of factors that are related to risk in the literature. And all of these are used to answer the ultimate question of, is there a mental abnormality or personality disorder that is driving this offending that leads to predatory sex offenses. So <clears throat> again, these are not a risk assessment. We're not looking at what is this individual's risk in five or 10 years. We're looking at something that creates lifetime risk. An SVP has a lifetime propensity to sexually reoffend. Um, and again, the disturbance is considered to be not considered to be curable, but can be treated and managed. Um, it's weird just talking to a blank screen, but I'm going to take the, I'm gonna take the slide off and so I can see people. Wait, why is this, okay. So, <clears throat> in terms of trafficking, in terms of the trafficking offenses, one of the, I think that one of the factors that we run into in the SVP assessments is that because for the part of the trafficker, um, oftentimes, at least the cases that we've seen, the, <clears throat> the motivation is primarily financial. And so if this is being done by somebody who's a pedophile or who has a long history of antisocial personality and behavior, we may be able to find SVP but when this is being done for financial means and, um, but the sexual piece is sort of, the sexual piece is in order to make money, then we have a harder time finding that person to have that mental abnormality or personality disorder that drives offending. Um, so what questions does anybody have about the SOAB or our process?
We haven't got any questions in the chat related to that yet, Stacy. Um, but folks can 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 share them now if they want to, and we can read them out. If you guys have questions, you can drop them in the chat. Well, we can prepare to move on to the panel discussion if you were finished with your presentation. I don't want to rush you. We still had a few more minutes. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Stacey, before we go to the panel discussion? Jonike, did I leave anything out here? Nope, you were great. All right. I, no, I don't have anything to add except that. Um, <coughs> let me pull up our contact information. Okay. And please feel free to reach out to me about any questions that you have about um, any assessments you see or about the SOAB in general. Um, Jonike and I, Megan, our executive director, are always happy to talk about the SOAB. So let me just go back to that. So here are all of our email addresses. And again, please feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. All righty, thank you so much. Now we're gonna um, unmute all of our panelists so that everybody has an opportunity to um, answer the questions. If people have more questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. I do see that we have one question that I see um, so far. And like I said, I'm going to open this up to all of our um, speakers to address this issue. But the question says, um, what do you think about the culture that is developing in which young girls are voluntarily participating in sexual exploitation, such as only fans? So who wants to dive into that one? I dropped a resource um, into the chat. I'm not sure if everybody saw it, but the Avery Center for Research and Services did a really tremendous um, deep dive into OnlyFans. They are, there are two co-founders of the Avery Center, Megan Lundstrom, who in addition to being a sociologist and researcher is also a survivor. And Dr. Henderson, Angie Henderson, who is um, a sociologist at the University of Northern Colorado. And their report is phenomenal, but even, and I really encourage everyone to, you know, check that out, check out what Angie and Megan have been saying with regards to OnlyFans, but also I, I believe it was two Sundays ago, The Daily, which is the New York Times podcast. Uh, you can listen to one of the New York Times articles about the e-pimping that is going on on OnlyFans. It's, um, you know, no matter, in my opinion, no matter which way you slice it, it's exploitation. And it's also a real, you know, feeding ground for traffickers and sex buyers to further exploit individuals. And we know that during the pandemic, every, you know, every vulnerability under the planet, you know, on the planet was really, really exposed. And for those who take advantage um, to exploit people, it was just like a perfect storm. I mean, I, I don't wanna you know, compare OnlyFans and the pandemic in the US to what's happening in Ukraine right now, but it's the same thing. We have a population of women and children fleeing a country. They have a vulnerability, they have no home, they don't know where they're going, they don't speak a language and technology in whichever platform is being utilized by exploiters to target a vulnerable population. There was a, an article in The Hill yesterday about the research that uh, Reuters has done on technology and trafficking along with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They just uh, you know, published their report on technology and trafficking. And I would suggest that people really take a look at it, but it's just, it's a, it's a feeding ground for traffickers. If I were a trafficker, I would go to OnlyFans and start recruiting. If I were a sex buyer, I would go to OnlyFans and, and start you know, recruiting, absolutely. But check out the Avery Center's report and, and Megan's comments, they're phenomenal. Okay. We'll do that. I think it's too important to um, remember, like you said in your presentation, that when we're talking about children, there is no element or requirement for that force 
fraud or coercion. So, okay, I know um, Anastasia wanted to answer this question as well. We're happy to hear your comments. Okay, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, I've had many conversations about OnlyFans with with just friends of mine and it is like she said it's such a platform I feel like the pornography industry only fans um, strip clubs those are just breeding grounds um, for traffickers they look for women who are seeking other things women who are in a position where I, I wouldn't say that women who do those things don't have a lot of security themselves or self-preservation but I do feel like that is usually the situation where women, um, it starts off as something like that. Um, with my experience, um, dating sites are also platforms for um, traffickers because they'll pose as um, suitors or trying to be, um, I, I, my trafficker personally would drive around poor areas. Um, he would go to the strip clubs. He would, he was on seeking arrangements and um, Tinder. And it's every platform I feel like is a danger. So I feel like the more awareness we build towards those platforms, we, these women are gonna do it regardless. Um, so I just, it's a very slippery slope of, mm -hmm. yes, you're independent, you're making your own money, you're doing your OnlyFans, go girl. And then it's people like that who, so I feel like maybe educating that group of people as well and making it more publicized that this could be a danger spot and to have like red flags of, um, warning signs of this might not be just someone on OnlyFans trying to tip you mm -hmm. or this might not be a guy on tinder who just wants to take you on a date because it turns to a date turns to oh do you want to make money and then it's it's every form of a trafficker it's not always the scary kind and it's not always the ones that um, will throw you in a trunk they come in so many shapes and forms and they're getting smarter so I feel like with programs like this that are doing so amazing at just publicizing this, um, I think it's really important to also add that though all of those platforms in raising awareness because uh -huh. it is important. I feel like if people knew the signs, then when it does happen, women will be like, well, I saw this, this might be a sign of someone being trafficked or a sign of any kind of abuse um, because they're, like I said, they're getting smarter. The manipulative coercion is as you guys saw in the video, I feel like I didn't get to say any, what I wanted in the beginning because I had a contractor walking through. So I was very like, of course it would happen then, but um, I just feel like they're getting smarter as far as, I didn't even know I was being trafficked while I was being trafficked. And now that I'm talking about it and, and after all the trials that I went through and speaking against them and putting them where they needed to be, I feel like it gave me the empowerment of if there's more people like me that talk about it. Um, like I said in the beginning about talking to our youth, if we spoke about the signs of trafficking when they are put in positions, you know, we talk to our kids about, you know, using protection and and don't drink and drive and don't talk to strangers and don't do this trafficking needs to be a conversation we have with our kids we need to be out in the schools we need to be out in the colleges and saying this might look like this this might look like a nice guy who wants to uh, flatter you with compliments and gifts and attention but that is just the first sign of grooming grooming means to prepare to prepare you to do something mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just so important in this day and age is talking about the subtle signs. Um, right. I had someone, I had someone call me yesterday that said the same thing. She was like, I'm really scared about the situation. Am I being paranoid? And I took, looked at her and I said, no, you're not like the, this could end up like this. So maybe that's a conversation. She sat down with her daughter and talked to her yesterday mm -hmm. because of something she saw posted about trafficking. So I do feel like these platforms are a very slippery slope. I'm not against them, but I'm not a big fan of them either. It's just raising the awareness is the first step to preventing trafficking through these platforms. So yeah, I hear you. And like you said, it's so important to just recognize and remember that it's not just a scary person. Uh, yeah, like, they I'm come in many shapes that. and colors. Yeah. Can right. I add Anastasia's excellent comments? And, and you said that really well, Anastasia. 
<laughs> Everyone says I speak so well and I feel like I just trip over my words all the time. <laughs> well, you brought up, I think, so many excellent points that I just want to like highlight. I, I think, first of all, going back to the education piece is so important. And even starting before trafficking is education about child sexual abuse, which is still very difficult to get into our schools. We know that trafficking victims, CSEC victims are those that are most vulnerable. We talked about LGBTQIA, um, disabled individuals, other vulnerabilities. Child sex abuse and foster care are two of the highest things that will make a child vulnerable to being abused again by traffickers and become part of, unfortunately, the whole, whole issue of exploitation. So the earlier we start educating in schools, the younger touch, recognition, not keeping secrets, et cetera. Um, the more important, I think, the more impact. And your point about tech, it's, it's so important to educate in elementary schools about the use of technology, about you don't know who's on the other side. You don't know who's posing. About what happens if you send pictures of yourself you think voluntarily. And that's the other point that you brought up very, very clearly. It is almost never at Mission Kids that when we have a suspected victim that they self-identify and say, yes, I'm being trafficked. Yes, I'm being exploited. But they think, as you've so eloquently said, that you're in control, it's a choice. And that's where all the time is needed as well. So again, thank you for your comments. I think you said them very well. Thank you. I agree with the foster care system as someone who was in foster care in Russia, but also here they let these kids slip through the cracks. They don't prepare them for life um, outside of foster care. So in, in my situation, I do feel like the system failed me because I, I didn't know anything about real life. And then, you know, we have all these kids in the foster system who don't get trained on, you know, how to be an adult after foster care. They're just worried about which home they're gonna go to. Um, they're just watching their things get thrown in trash bags and shipped off to the next home. I lost count of how many foster homes I had, but you're just a number in their system and you get lost. And then things like what happened to me is getting out of foster care, I had nothing. We don't, I, I had no tools to get me through that 18 to 20 to 21. I, I mean, your brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25 to 30 and even beyond. At 18, I was making life altering decisions that I wasn't prepared to make. So that's something else. The foster system is such a broken system, but women and, and men and boys get trafficked and get put in circumstances where they do feel like they have no other choice. I felt backed into a corner. I was homeless. I had nothing. And someone offered me help. And in that point, it was survival. And I thought I was making the right decisions. And in the end, I ended up going through the most horrific six months of my life that has still impacted me to this day. So it's rewinding and breaking the system of what, what our culture is. I mean, the foster system is a start. The platforms are a start. Just basic education and basic, you know, I said this in a news interview recently, it's, it's an uncomfortable topic to talk about, but it's way more uncomfortable being in it. And it's way more uncomfortable having people you love go through it. Um, I've known women who are trafficked that are dead now and not alive. And we just have to, make a change and break the system. Because at this point, if there wasn't programs like you guys, I feel like if there's programs like this and all these houses I work with, I would have gotten out of being trafficked a long time before it even happened. There was no, nothing then like there is now. Mm -hmm. So it's just really, it, it, it makes me happy to see that there's a lot of growth and there's uh, more awareness and that a lot of women are gonna be sh saved. Um, I've had a lot of like, oh, I wish that was around when I, but that's why I feel like this is important for me to do now to just talk about it and raise awareness and help as much as I can. So I appreciate you guys for letting me Certainly. participate in this project. So yeah, we're so glad you're a part of it. Um, how yeah. about Michelle? Did you want to add anything to that question? Yeah, I did put some resources in the chat box. We do um, a lot of education around this. And I know somebody said, um, about the access of online games and video games. So a lot of education around that is just what are red flags. We know that 
traffickers and exploiters are spending time where vulnerable people are spending time. And again, that's on the internet. So we know that oftentimes maybe they're reaching out on Instagram and they're friending all of your friends or following them so that they don't seem like a stranger. And they slowly start to build this safety net, this friendship over time, like they're not jumping right in and asking for explicit photos or content. And then they move the chat to Snapchat or somewhere where it's not as easily traceable. And then it moves to meeting up in person. So I think the more that we educate caregivers around that, instead of just giving kids cell phones and not seeing who they're spending time with, where they're spending their time, talking to them about safety. That's really what we need to do. Um, and then just educating everyone about safe technology use is super important. Um, it's not the responsibility of children to prevent child abuse, but I think that there's a lot of ways that we can empower them. Um, I did mention that we use a program called Not a Number through the program Love 146. Um, that's for kids ages 12 through 18, but it really talks about risk reduction. It's not at all similar to the D.A.R.E. model of saying, here's all the drugs in the world, just don't do them, like they're bad for you. Instead, it's talking about these are situations that you might find yourself in, or you tell me what you might experience and how can we make this a safer situation? Who are the safe adults that you can talk to? What's your exit plan? Like it doesn't have to be a life or death situation before you leave, but like who are your safety contacts? Where's your safe place? What can you do if you feel unsafe? So we really need to have these um, tough conversations with both kids and caregivers um, and service providers as well. It's super important. See some more questions popping in. Someone's asking if anyone's familiar with the use of body art tattooing to mark their victims. Anybody want to address that? I can touch base on that too. Okay. Um, I when I was being trafficked, a lot of traffickers will use the form of, like she said, tattooing or branding. Um, to claim ownership of the woman. And that is um, usually it's a name or it's a sign. Um, it could be a letter even. That's a real clear sign of someone that's owned or has been claimed. It is also a way for other traffickers to know that that woman is not available. Um, a lot of traffickers are known to do that to um, women who are trying to leave um, because in that, in that, it's called, the game in, in that circle on the other side. Um, it is for the other, sorry, the other women who are working to know that that woman is unavailable, unapproachable. Um, most women that are being branded are known to not make eye contact with anybody. If you're branded, you look at the floor and you walk in front of your trafficker, not behind. Um, it's, there's just a lot of signs with that. Um, I was fortunate not to be branded. Um, I almost was but I know a lot of women who have been, and I feel I, um, when I was doing advocacy work a couple years ago, I was asked if I had any brands, if I had a brand on me and they offered if I did to cover it up. So I think that's really important because that leaves a lot of shame and a lot of um, trauma to have to look at that constantly. So that is a very common form of ownership of traffickers. Thank you. Here's another one. How can people in the anti SV movement balance destigmatizing sex workers and bringing awareness to the dangers of human trafficking within the sex work industry? Can I take that one, Suzanne? Sure. So there's a, um, a lot of conversation in the anti trafficking, anti exploitation movement about this term, sex work. And I know that in the media, um, the AP style book has really sort of influenced the way that I think people perceive um, sex work as being normalized because the AP style book is telling the media and reporters not to use the term prostitute or prostitution. As an, you know, and there's a whole conversation in the policy space nationally and internationally about how um, the sex trade should be legislated or 
you know, what should the policies be surrounding the sex trade? And in the United States right now, the policy across the board in all 50 states, including Nevada, is that prostitution is a crime, but buying sex is a crime, sex trafficking is a crime, promoting prostitution is a crime. So criminalization is the policy lens through which the United States looks at it. And I think that's a huge part of what the stigmatization is. I also know that the survivors of sex trafficking and who've exited prostitution and might not have had that third party pimp control really discourage individuals um, from using that term sex work because it normalizes. Um, and again, I'm not speaking you know, on behalf of survivors, but it normalizes, in my opinion, what I've seen through the work I've been doing you know, for close to 12 years now, exclusively in the anti-exploitation space. Um, it normalizes the harms that are being caused because it's being labeled as something that's work. And what goes along with that, I think, is the fact that we're really, we really pull back and aren't looking at what the law says. I'm a lawyer and I look at the crimes code. And when people start talking to me about like, let's decriminalize sex work, I, I ask them where in the crimes code is sex work a crime? It's not, not in all 50 states. Um, it's prostitution. And so when we talk about policy reforms, I'm talking about a legal term and I never want to be offensive to anyone, but it's the crime and the crimes code. And to be clear, we advocate here at the Institute for the Equality Model, which I don't believe that the crime of prostitution, the sale of sex should exist in any of our states. I do believe that trafficking should be a crime, promoting prostitution should be a crime, and, and buying sex should be a crime. And they are crimes in all 50 states right now. It just depends on how law enforcement in any different jurisdiction is looking at them. So the conflation, to go back to the point of, of the question, there is a conflation between sex work and sex trafficking, and people get really confused by this. But when I was talking to all y'all about the law at the beginning of, of my presentation, the purpose of sex trafficking is a commercial sex act. It's in the law, so it has to be proven. And what do people, like everyone in the world, see? They see prostitution right? Because prostitution is a commercial sex act. So I don't want to conflate sex trafficking with prostitution to say that all prostitution or the sale of sex is sex trafficking. What I do want to say is we can't divorce the conversation because all sex trafficking, every time sex trafficking is occurring, it involves prostitution. So when the stigmatization gets involved, I just think that we really need to take a step back and not normalize our language around something that I think is exploitive and not looking at the harms, but saying like, why is prostitution a crime in the first place when the majority of people, at least the people that I know who've exited, um, never really had a choice to begin with. And I think that, you know, by being trauma informed, by being non-judgmental, by asking not the why questions, but you know, like, why did you do this? But like, how did this come to be? And let's talk about this is super important. It's not my job. I'm, I'm not a judge, right? So I'm not making those decisions. I just, I wanna help people. And I think that if we are in conversations with people and sort of unpack um, the nuances of what terms and words and rhetoric means, it gives us an opportunity to really explore what it is that we're talking about. When I hear things like strippers for decrim, again, I pull out Pennsylvania's crimes code and say, point to me where stripping is a crime, because it's not. And you know, let's have a conversation. But again, I am a lawyer and I get to say like, let's fall back on the terms and the law. But you guys can read the crimes code yourself. You know, you can search for sex work. It's not in there, I can promise you. Stripping, it's not in there. You know, pornography is, is not in there. Manufacturing pornography, you know, child pornography is a crime, right? But being a victim or being someone in pornography is not a crime. So I think that we need to look at what the spectrum of the sex trade really is and, um, and, and think about how our words and our terms and our language choices really do impact the stigmatization. Thank you. Did anybody else wanna to speak to that question? 
to another, can folks discuss how this may be affecting LGBTQ youth specifically? I, I can talk about that just for, for a minute. Um, I, I did touch on it briefly. We know that victims, children, adolescents who fall prey uh, to traffickers and into exploitive situations are those who are the most vulnerable. We know that often the youth in the LGBTQ community are very vulnerable, especially with what is going on with the conversations today. And that could be something all on its own for a days long discussion about conversations, marginalization, acceptance, not acceptance. When you combine that with an adolescent, I haven't yet heard of any adolescent that hasn't had questions about their own self esteem are they good enough do they fit in with their peers how are they looked at by everyone everybody everything and then you layer on top of that lgbtqia plus you, you know just tremendous what the effect can be in terms of vulnerability so i hope that answers the question about how it affects them Thank you. um someone's asking if you know if it would be more likely for a survivor to be tattooed themselves, I guess, by the the offender, or take, or would they take them to an actual tattoo shop? I don't know if anybody has any knowledge of that, that's a hard one. I've had clients tattooed by the trafficker, tattooed in um, tattoo establishments that are like oh. legitimate. But I've also had clients tell me they were taken to a home where somebody was doing tattoos, and you know, I. I don't have research on percentages, but it happens all different kinds of ways. I can't say more specifically, it happens more often than not. I know that we've done outreach to um, tattoo businesses. I've had tattoo businesses that are really amazing that have offered you know, pro bono services to have tattoos redesigned um, and, and, and fixed. Um, but I, I would probably say more often than not, my clients, especially the ones that I've had in the past who were kids at the time they were branded, um, they were taken to like a home where somebody was doing tattoos with tattoo kits. And I think, I don't know if Anastasia can speak to this as well, but something that we talk about with um, service providers and others that might interact with kids regularly, if you see them with a new tattoo, you don't have to call them out on it, but maybe just ask a couple more questions. Like it shouldn't be that easily accessible for kids to get tattoos. So if someone maybe just asked the question, it could start more of a conversation. Um, Anastasia, I don't know if you had any other thoughts on that. Um, I, I mean, I've seen all, I mean, the original question I've seen personally and heard of every form, like they said, um, with children that you're completely right on that. If a child is getting a tattoo that's specifically a name, I don't feel like a lot of parents would be crazy about that or even approve of that. So in any tattoo shops, usually you need a parental signature. So yeah, in schools, I feel like if you did see that, that could be a sign of being trafficked or being prepared to be trafficked because traffickers will po pose as a boyfriend first. And then, you know, that tattoo is not branding in the beginning. It's, oh, I love you, get this tattoo. And then it's, um, it's can be, you know, more of the brand later. Um, I've seen that. Um, I actually personally watched someone brand someone and they used like a hanger and they literally like singed her. So there's just violent ways I've seen it done. Um, but the, the underage is a big, big red flag as far as, um, as far as if someone is being tattooed or branded or perceived or owned. So yeah, I agree with that. It also can be used by first responders as a way to start a conversation because we've talked about how difficult it is for identification. And I know of one case in particular where a medical student was in a hospital and she was sitting with um, an adolescent in an ICU bedside. And that adolescent she said had a dollar sign um, tattooed on her shoulder. And she used it as a way to start a conversation with this adolescent. Oh, gee, I see that you have that tattoo. You, you know, tell me about it. And one thing led to another and it opened up just a comfort level. There was no judgment in the tone, just a G, tell me about it. And it led to suspicion and, and identification of trafficking. So it, it could be used in that way by us as well. It, also in the healthcare profession, I feel like there could be a lot of more um, 
awareness as far as healthcare workers, people who work, you know, in OBGYN or Planned Parenthood, I would go get a um, STD screening and a pregnancy test every couple of weeks. And the same person would check me in. That's a big red flag. Why is this woman getting the same test over and over and over again? Um, why does she constantly, you know, need a full urine sample, a full, you know, that's a big red flag for first responders or people in the medical field. Um, I, I feel like I can advocate for that because I was on the other side of it. And I would come to these doctors with bruises on me. Um, I would come with, you know, I would wear long sleeves during the summer because I was covering things up. There was just a lot of things where I feel like friends, family, healthcare workers, even any interaction I had with police enforcement um, to touch base on something you had said earlier was really um, the word prostitute is such a big, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a stab wound. So to say that word is such an aggressive word to say towards someone who's already doing it and already ashamed of it. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to be a prostitute. That's just not um, how it's done. Most women are very ashamed. So they will go above and beyond to hide what they're ashamed of. Um, but when you're doing point blank things like getting tests and going to medical professionals, that could be a conversation that, you know, a nurse or someone could have and, oh, you're really coming in here often and just start something very gentle that could lead to her opening up. A lot of women who are being trafficked are, very, are, are not going to speak to male, male presence. It's just, it's if they're being abused by one, they're usually going to feel more comfortable with a woman and a woman that's not in a, um, in a position of authority as like police enforcement. Um, so with that being said, that is, there's so many red flags with the inside of our, um, oh, sorry, I can't talk today, inside of our um, police, uh, the police and the medical field, there's just big red flags. I mean, I was in an ambulance while I was being trafficked and the the person that picked me up in the ambulance was someone who had paid to see me two weeks before and I begged him to help me and he did nothing. So there's just so many ways our system fails us. And if someone's crying out for help, even without you knowing it subtly, um, letting you, you know, a woman's not just going to show her bruises off. And if she is, she probably wants you to know that she's being hurt without saying a word. So. There's just a lot of big red flags with that. Thank you. That's so impactful and gives us so many more ways to like keep our eyes open and, and to pay attention. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. It's almost time for this training to end, but I want to end with one last question that I'm going to ask each of you. I want you to tell us if you could pick two things as next steps, what you hope the learners will do as a result of listening to these to, to this training, what two things would you suggest? And anybody who wants can go first. I'll go. Um, I would hit on identification. We've heard it talked about over and over again in these last few hours. I would hope that everybody would go back speak with your agency about getting trainings in, specifically about identification of victims, um, and then talk with your teams, people that you work with about identification training on a, when I say community basis, I mean not only out in the community, but the professional community to break down those silos, start breaking them down so that you can get a better overall team response to trafficking in your area and education. We were talking about this before, starting education, young, education on child sex abuse, on trafficking, and this is in schools, in the community, so that the community awareness can begin. It's got to be a large encapsulating response from everybody. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah. I thought what Abby said, I think that um, these crimes are crimes that thrive in silence. So just talk to people about this. Um, I'll talk to anyone who will listen. I think the billboards were glaring and in people's faces and it obviously generated um, some conversation around it. So just talk about it. Um, and then obviously follow our campaign on social media and engage and share. Um, it really drives up 
information around it. And I just keep thinking about how a lot of survivors say that there weren't resources, there weren't things like this available to them. So if we can make a difference in one person's life, I think that um, that will help. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Shay? Um, oh, two things. Wow, you're really limiting me here. Not fair. <laughs> Not fair at all. I think um, I would love for everyone to read our 2022 report that we just published. And Lex can put the link back in there again. I know she did before, but um, the second thing after you read the report and go kind of go back into the reports that we've been putting out there since 2016 is learn more about the equality model and legislative reforms that need to happen here in Pennsylvania. And, um, one of the things I think will help everyone is I'm just waiting for the links uh, from our tech guys uh, from our symposium that happened earlier this month. And the fourth panel in our symposium was a tremendous panel of experts talking about the equality model and how important it is to unpack and understand what words mean and how laws and policies do help form societal you know notions and, and ideas and if you are interested in policy reforms just to reach out to us because we can have that conversation even more awesome how about um anyone from the soap board want to tell us your top two takeaways you want the listeners to to lead with well how about anastasia what top two things would you like for the listeners to leave with? Um, I've, the education is really important to me. Um, the um, I just feel like, like I said before, I feel like the more it's talked about and the more we educate our parents and our, um, our police enforcement, our medical professionals, anyone in a position where if we talk about the signs and the red flags, there would be so many more cases that are going to be more watched and um, we just have to open our eyes and look around. So I feel like that for me, education is the most important. Um, and like I said, the more programs that are out here that can help women, the more women will get out. Um, there can be so much prevented if we just have more organizations, more, how, um, more safe houses, more um, just resources. I think resources is so important. If I had had a way out, if I had a ticket out, I would have taken it 100%. Um, and the last eight, nine years of my life, I have groveled to get to where I am and I've done it on my own and I'm proud of that, but women shouldn't have to do it on their own. Women should have the support in any situation in trafficking and domestic abusive relationships. I'm so for just raising awareness and really just helping these women to know that they're not alone and that they, they don't have to do it alone. So the resources, the, um, the education is really the most important to me. I looking around and seeing how many women are being helped me doing my part to try to make a difference. Um, it just, it's, it's been part of my healing journey and I just thank you guys so much. All of you are amazing and incredible and you guys are doing such great things. So those would be my last two. And I just want to say again, thank you for letting me be a part of this. This was amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our presenters um, for just kind of displaying the power of collaboration. And we're, we're really excited about the campaign. We're, we're hopeful that we're going to see those numbers increase. And as we share resources, um, just know that help is there and it's available. So if you want to receive printed copies, don't forget that you can email to us and let us know on which materials you'd like to receive and we can get that mailed out to you. You will receive an email about completing a survey for uh, evaluation of the training, just to let us know your thoughts on the training altogether. And uh, we will be in touch. I do wanna thank all the members of the OVA staff for all that you've done to make this training possible. All the work is a lot of hard work that people put in and I acknowledge that and recognize it. And thank you all so much. And thank you to all of our presenters and for all the participants for sharing this time and this space with us today. And we look forward to hearing more and sharing more resources with you. This is just the first step. Thank you. <laughs>